Well, I think in this um, third presentation, it will be high time or over time for me to offer some positive reason for um, <clears throat> taking the line I do and get past the preparation. Stay close to the mic because they can't hear you. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> but before going on to that, I think uh, that um, it would be appropriate to try to say something more about two issues that uh, Dr. Warren has been pursuing. The first and more difficult one, I think, is about the nature of value. Um, <clears throat> I can't give a complete account of the nature of value, and particularly of moral value, um, which I regard as satisfactory. Um, all that I think I can do is to uh, make one fundamental point and one suggestion which I think um, um, constitutes a certain amount of progress. The general line I want to take, as I think all humanists do, is that value is somehow, somehow a function of um, human desires, human wishes, and so on. And this carries the implication um, that there would be something absurd about saying that there was value in a world where there were uh, no, not perhaps no human beings, but no conscious uh, rational beings at all. But um, it's pretty clear to me that one cannot from this statement immediately infer that um, uh, therefore, therefore, uh, value is just a matter, merely a matter, either of individual taste, desire, and so on, or of group taste, desire, and so on, of the collective taste. And the most helpful thing I can think of to bring out why one can't immediately infer this is to think of um, another sort of value, not of moral value, but of market value. Now, surely, the going price of, let's say, a 1974 Volkswagen Beetle in northern Texas um, is a matter of fact independent of the desires or wishes of any particular buyers or would-be buyers of Volkswagen Beetles and of any particular sellers or would-be sellers. If you are either a buyer or seller, you will recognize this with, of course, regret. That's to say, you can't uh, fix the price just where you'd like to have it. Um, uh, it is determined by things independent of you. And yet, and yet, it would clearly be absurd to say that there could be a going price for this or any other uh, marketable product if there were just no people around at all. The idea of, you know, the going price for a Volkswagen Beetle if after some unhappy natural disaster there was no one left in North Texas would be an absurdity. Um, so, here one has an example of a sort of value where the um, Value is, in a way, objective. That's to say, it's um, independent of any particular tastes, desires of any particular people. On the other hand, um, it's uh, uh, not objective in the sense that it's somehow written into the structure of the universe and would be there regardless of any human desires at all. Um, so. Uh, seeing things in this way, it seems to me, though I can't give a full and adequate account of the nature of moral value, uh, that it's at least possible to maintain without contradiction that value is somehow a function of human purposes, desires, and so on. That's to say, it would be absurd to suggest that there were values of any sort without human beings or other conscious beings, but though this is so, it seems to me that one can, without contradiction, say uh, that it's not just and always and only a matter of, um, well, I like it and you don't, or even um, uh, my group, my peer group likes this and your peer group likes that and that's how it is at all. 
Well, um, I know that's not enough, um, but it's the uh, best I can do, and it seems to me it's the best anyone can do at the moment, in that um, I know of no other philosoph philosoph philosophical writing in this area, which seems to me uh, to constitute clear progress on that. The second of the things that um, Dr. Warren is keen to pursue, I, that I think I ought to take up with, is this business about um, uh, the first woman or the first baby and so on. Um, <clears throat> I find this a, a, a bit difficult because it does seem to me that I've already provided a um, reply that is satisfactory within um, evolutionary assumptions um, uh, for this. Uh, you know, I can well understand that Dr. Warren will not agree with me uh, that the uh, theory of evolution by natural selection constitutes a true account of the origin of species, and I don't ask him to believe that it does. But it does seem to me that if once you allow that it is a true account, uh, then um, it would seem to be that the obviously right thing to say, consistent with this account, is uh, that there will not be sharp and absolute lines between um, the population of one species and the population of another, uh, such that uh, you can have a set of labels for different species and be absolutely certain beyond the possibility of doubt, if you've seen the whole creature, that uh, uh, this is where lines stop and this is where something else begins. You're bound to have cases shading from one into the other. And um, about the law of the excluded middle in general, it surely can only be applied uh, to um, uh, terms and contrasts which are adequately sharp. Um, uh, you can't just say, uh, well, either he's bald or he isn't, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, don't beat about the bush. I want to have a straight answer to this. I mean, there just are people whom you can't describe as being categorically and decisively bald or categorically and decisively not bald. Uh, and we invent a, a, an intermediate term for this, getting a bit thin on top and so on. And in exactly the same sort of way, it seems to me that one can't have an absolutely sharp line uh, between uh, human beings and uh, uh, creatures that are um, uh, you know, shading off into the fully human. Well, uh, so much for those two things. It's now high time and over time for me to offer some positive reasons. And the first of these positive reasons uh, will be an old very one, very familiar in its first moves, of course, to Dr. Warren. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it is the contention that the things that are said in his religious system about evil are just inconsistent with the things that are said about the power and the goodness of God. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to try to put my point here um, in a way which um, leaves a bit of the argument which I imagine that he and I would agree about behind, and I hope to, as it were, come in um, uh, at the point where I think we're going to uh, disagree. Now, um, the um, standard reply, which I think would be the line that Dr. Warren would take to the objection that it's just inconsistent to say that uh, God is all-powerful, that God is uh, uh, good without limit, and then uh, to say, uh, as a third thing, that there is a dreadful amount of evil in the world and above all human sin, the um, comeback to this is always to say, ah, uh, but uh, you uh, couldn't have free, responsible human beings um, uh, without there being a live possibility that these free, responsible human beings uh, would be delinquent and would, as alas, all too many of us do, um, commit um, lamentable sins. Yes, well, um, uh, 
Here, I think one needs to uh, look a bit carefully about um, uh, what is involved in freedom, and perhaps we'll come back to that later. But um, as a quick objection here, without going into do all this, um, it is surely part of the system, shared, of course, um, uh, by Dr. Warren and many, many other uh, Christians, uh, uh, that it, it involves saying that uh, on earth we are uh, living through a period of probation. It's then said that uh, for it to ma it make sense to talk of human responsibility and choice and so on, um, uh, there's got to be this life possibility, which is unfortunately realized that people will make the wrong choices. Okay, let's allow this um, for the sake of the argument, and I think that, that this is substantially right. But now, how, if you're going to say this, are you able to offer a guarantee that some of those responsible creatures uh, for whom the live possibility of going both right and wrong, and in particular the live possibility of going wrong, is an essential, you know, if they're to be free and responsible creatures, they've got to have this life. How are you going to be able to say, as is constantly done, uh, that, well, uh, if they are among those who have done the right thing in this life, if they are among the saved, for all eternity they are going to continue as presumably free, responsible human beings, children of God and so on. And there's no danger thereafter of them lapsing again. If the live possibility of disastrous evil is a necessary condition of human freedom and responsibility in this life. Why does it cease to be a necessary condition, precondition of a responsible life in a world to come? Of course, one can apply the same argument to God himself. Uh, presumably, um, if God has a power to choose, so there must be the same sort of live possibility of even God making the wrong choice if God is to be a free, responsible agent. But I don't want to press that one in particular because the thing which seems to me must be pressed most urgently. One can see how one can say, ah, well, it's too late for the damned. Um, uh, uh, you know, they might change their minds, but then their new choice wouldn't be recognized or something. They'd be told, it's too late for you to apply for heaven now, though you've now changed your mind. But what I can't see is how you can consistently insist that um, this life, freedom involving a real live possibility constantly realized in this life of deplorable sinfulness, why this is essential to human responsibility in this life, but it somehow seems not to be essential uh, once you're saved. This does seem to me um, <coughs> to be a contradiction here. And it's a very important one, because supposing it's admitted that it's not essential to have this live possibility of error, however we define this live possibility of error, then um, uh, we're back again to the point, uh, well, <coughs> if God could, as this is now admitting, presumably have cre cre created men so that they would all have done the right thing, why, if he's infinitely good, didn't he? do so. Um, hmm. um, well, that's um, one point of which seems to me uh, that the um, old familiar dilemma of the problem of evil, which is a challenge to the consistency of Christian fundamentals, um, I don't think this dilemma can be met, or in particular, it doesn't seem to me it is met by any system which says, oh, well, the reason the two things are, the things are compatible is that it is a necessary condition of freedom that there should be a live possibility of delinquency. And then goes on to say, but of course, these free beings, when they are saved after death, are guaranteed for all eternity not to lapse again. 
after all, in some systems at any rate, it apparently, uh, even uh, the angels in heaven existing with God, presumably from a stage earlier than the creation of the world, were not apparently guaranteed secure. Um, Lucifer and others sinned and fell before. But now, how is it possible uh, for uh, uh, Lucifer uh, to have had this you know, live possibility, which he then realized, of delinquency, um, and for human beings after death to be safe? Now, um, uh, someone says that um, uh, they believe that there is a being all-powerful and so on, personal and so on. Uh, and of course, this being is immeasurably greater than human beings, and of course, it's incorporeal. Uh, well, now, um, uh, how do we um, uh, point out, how do we pick out as a subject of discourse um, the object that we are saying has these characteristics? Um, uh, one way, of course, of doing it would be to say, oh, well, of course, these characteristics, you know, infinite power and so on, do not belong to any um, uh, particular thing in the universe. You know, we're not saying that something over there has all these. This would be ridiculous. Of course, we're not saying that. Um, uh, well, we're really saying it about the whole universe. But now, this move, which has been made by some, is clearly unacceptable to Christians, because this is a pantheist move. So one says, oh well, it, uh, we're not saying this about um, any particular thing in the universe or about the universe as a whole. We're saying it about something outside the universe. Well, um, <laughs> yes, um, I can see What's being said about something, my difficulty is to see um, um, to what as I've got to attach these remarks as the subject. You know, what are these things being said about? And it's all very well saying, oh well, they're being said about God. Yes, well, of course, one knew that, but um, how does one pick out this subject, indicate um, uh, what it is? To which ones, uh, about which ones wanting to say the various things. Well, uh, maybe this isn't clear, maybe it isn't satisfactory, but um, it seems to me that there is a difficulty here, and it's one of the many difficulties um, of my second sort. You see, the first uh, positive objection I've been giving is of the um, sort that I uh, grouped in uh, group uh, three, you know, the round square, the contradiction sort. This one is the beginnings of an objection that belongs to the, if I may say so, fairy sort, um, uh, which in which I'm suggesting that um, though it looks as if one's uh, making a substantial suggestion about the universe, a suggestion that might be tested, um, uh, really, one isn't making that substantial suggestion. One's got a doctrine that just can't be tested or even applied at all. Dr. Flew, uh, gentlemen moderators, ladies and gentlemen, I'm certainly happy to be before you for the last time that I'll be before you this evening. Uh, Dr. Flew will have a very brief rejoinder to close the session tonight. And I should like to begin with um, a question that was raised in my last speech. In fact, I've raised it in two speeches and it's not been referred to uh, by Dr. Flew as yet. He has indicated that the Nazis who were tried at Nuremberg were tried by international law. And I have indicated that this was not really the basis, it was not the final ultimate basis, that there was a recognition that there was a higher law. That if it were the case that only various men from various nations got together and decided on it, I would like to raise this question for Dr. Flew. I'd like for him to write it in his notes and be sure to deal with it. Would it have been possible for those in the prosecution at Nuremberg to have decided 
that the Nazis actually did no wrong in murdering the Jews as they did, and to have decided to set free such men as Adolf Eichmann, and had Adolf Hitler survived the war and had been on trial, to have set him free as simply because they had decided on the basis of human needs and desires that everything he did was right. Now, I want you to be sure to be listening to see if he will deal with this. The truth of the matter is the implication of the atheistic system does not allow objective moral right, objective moral wrong, and therefore he cannot deal with this problem on an adequate basis. He then promised to give us positive reason why he knows that God does not exist, but suggested that perhaps it would be better if he first dealt a little more with the nature of value, and hastened to tell us that he could not give us a satisfactory explanation of it. And for once, I am in agreement with Dr. Flew. <laughs> value is somehow, he says, a function of human needs and desires, which really is a way of saying that it depends upon nothing really more than your likes and dislikes, your approvals and disapprovals. But Dr. Flew says that you cannot infer that value is merely a matter of taste. It is a very crucial word for him to say merely. While morality is subjective, he hastens to add, it is not merely subjective. Now what this amounts to is this. He wants to say, in harmony with the implications of his, athe of his atheistic doctrine, that morality is subjective, but there is something within him that won't let him go all the way. That thing is conscience. He cannot tolerate the actions of the Nazis or many things that happen all around us every day and simply dismiss it and say, well, those people believed it was right. Dr. Flew values a fact of life, and if you cannot give empirical evidence of its nature and origin, then you cannot prove atheism, because a fundamental doctrine of atheism is that matter is the sole reality. In fact, an absurd quotation which Dr. Flew has endorsed is, everything there is is a product of nature. Now, since nature is, since nature exists, but if everything that exists is a product of nature, then therefore nature is a product of itself. And that would have at one time nature not existing and nothing existing, but some, nothing bringing nature into, exi into, exi into existence. It is therefore clear that Dr. Flew simply cannot deal with the matter of value. He then comes to the question of the first woman or the first baby. And he says that he feels uh, very satisfied with the answer which he has given, provided we will allow him the evolutionary assumption. But Dr. Flew, that's the very thing that we will not allow you. It is not merely your responsibility to tell us what you might assume or what might be concluded from various assumptions, but it is your responsibility when you put your signature to the proposition, I know that God does not exist to prove to us that matter is all that exists, that matter is eternal, that out of dead rocks and dirt, human beings have come by what he alleges to be the various stages of evolution. The truth of the matter is, in these questions, which I read before, and I will not take the time to reread, he first said that no human being living now or who has ever lived, came into being by something that already existed that was not human, but was transformed into a human being. He has also said that no human being now living or that ever has lived was born of some non-human thing, begotten by some non-human thing and born of some non-human thing. There are the only conceivable ways it could have occurred, and he has given up both of them. Now, Dr. Flew, you have not dealt with this matter at all. To simply say, if you will grant me the evolutionary assumption, then it is all right for me to say I can't tell you which was first a woman or a baby. The truth of the matter is, the theist who believes in Almighty God has absolutely no trouble with it, and it fits all the facts. 
Dr. Flew must deny major undisputed fact that human beings come only from human beings. He has no proof, absolutely no proof to the contrary. The human race had to begin by miraculous power, something out of the ordinary of the physical law by which we all know we get here. The record that the first man and woman owe their existence to the miraculous power of Almighty God fits the facts as we know them. His contention does not fit the facts. He's already denied it in your presence here tonight. Now he comes to the law of excluded metal, and again I am amazed at this man whom I assure you is among the most learned men in the world and seeks to rid himself of the law of excluded metal by asking us to accept his explanation by saying that it simply won't do to say that either a man is bald or he isn't bald. Now, Dr. Flew, that depends upon the definition of bald. If two men have agreed that, look, we'll talk about bald without knowing what we're talking about, then that statement, of course, could be an illustration. But if by bald you mean a man who has less than 100 hairs on his head and a man has 99, then if you say he is bald, then that statement is true. But if he has 101, then it's false. You see, the law of excluded middle applies only to precisely stated propositions. It doesn't apply to ambiguous propositions. But every precisely stated proposition is either true or false. Now, you can't get off the ground with the enterprise of human thought without recognizing the truth of the law of excluded middle and the law of contradiction. Now, I reiterate, everything in this world is either human or not human, and it has always been that way. There never has been anything on this earth that was neither human nor non-human. Now, Dr. Flew, since your doctrine is based upon empirical evidence, observation, I ask you, have you ever seen something that was neither human nor non-human? I plead with him to write this in his notes and to give us the answer in his rejoinder, which he'll have in just a moment. Have you ever seen anything that was either human or non-human? Have you ever heard of anyone else who ever did? Is there any kind of scientific historical record of anything that was ever e neither non-human or human? Now, my friends, that is simply a dodge and an evasion of the very obvious truth that God Almighty has given to us that every one of us can see. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Every human being constitutes evidence for God. If evolution is true, then he must have these shades which he talks about, but he does not have them. He does not have the evidence which he alleges. Now he turns to evil. Now, Dr. Flew, I am not going to make your argument. I'm not going to make your argument for you. If you have an argument involving evil, if you want to say that there is something about the concept of God that along with evil constitutes some kind of a problem, you're going to have to make the argument that shows it. Are you willing to say that the concept of God itself, without reference to any empirical fact, is incoherent, meaningless, self-contradictory? Yeah. All right, thank you. Pin this down in your mind and listen to see if he deals with it. Or is it the case that in order to allege that the concept of God is incoherent, that somehow or other it's logically incompatible with itself, that he must refer to empirical fact, he then, you see, is not talking merely about the concept, but he's talking about some sort of incompatibility between God and some alleged fact in the universe, which is an entirely different argument from merely saying that the concept of God itself is incoherent. Now, Dr. Flew, it is not enough to say there are some very interesting or there are some puzzling, there are some difficult questions for us in regard to the fact that evil and suffering, even such monstrosities as have occurred as I've talked about tonight in Hitler's Germany, but you have not shown this is true, this is true, this is true, therefore God could not exist. And I await the time until you do it. And I assure you that there is no problem, there will be no reason for us to be afraid of it at all. But I will not make your argument ahead of you. I, I demand that you make the argument on evil if you have it. Now he comes to freedom. He says if freedom is necessary in this life, in other words, for there to be moral beings, for there to be moral accountability, why is it not in the world to come? 
Now again, this is merely a question. It is not an argument. He has not said, this is true, and this is true, and therefore, there can be no God. All he's doing at this point is raising what he at least assumes to be rather puzzling questions. Now, Dr. Flew, I insist that you make an argument. His responsibility is to come up with the information that says, I therefore know that God does not exist. To merely ask a question, why must we be free in this life and not free in the life to come, does not warrant the deduction, therefore, God does not exist. Of course it is the case that in the infinite wisdom of God, this world formed to be inhabited as an environment of soul making, a place for us to make our decision, the one and only probationary period of man, and when this life is over, we have been informed of, by God's omniscience that we will not fall from that place. In heaven, we will have already seen the destiny uh, of evil men and be eternally reminded by the existence of the lost. And God's omniscience lets us know that this is the case. Now, what Dr. Flew must do is show that he knows it's the case and that it involves a logical contradiction which demands that God does not exist, but he has not done so. Now, he says he's going to show us a dilemma which obtains between God and evil, but he has not done so. I even wrote, as he started writing that, I wrote down uh, in brackets underneath what I was going to say about it, but he didn't go on and make the argument. Dr. Flew, we await your making of the argument and rather than simply raising an interesting question. Now, he says, we have the problem of knowing what these things are being said about. But again, he has not made any argument on it. He has not known, shown why there is any problem at all. Do men know what God means? Let us have on the chart number 22B. Atheists cannot determine the non-existence of God from the concept alone. If Dr. Flew thinks that he can, I invite him to the task. Let him set forth merely the concept of God without reference to anything in this world that is the problem of evil and show us that God does not exist. The truth of the matter is his argument will, when he finally makes it for you, will involve both the concept of God and the empirical fact of evil, which will be a, con a combination of a concept and a fact, and from that he will deduce the non-existence of God, or will seek to do so. Now let us see chart number 22C. When only God existed, now given the theistic assumption, when only God existed before the world was created, we have here a circle indicating God infinite in his attributes, power, knowledge, wisdom, presence, goodness, love, justice, righteousness, holiness, and so forth. Now, no evil anywhere in the world. Thus, no empirical facts with which to allege incompatibility with God. Now, I challenge Dr. Flew to take this chart and to show wherein the incompatibility which, uh, which allows this conclusion, therefore God does not exist, which he alleges. Now, now chart number Five minutes, did you say? All right, five minutes. Now, I have covered everything that Dr. Flew has said, and so I want to go to some uh, more negative material, and I call attention to the uh, chart number 9A1. Chart number 9A1. Now, I've earlier introduced a chart in which I have shown a prison which... Um, Dr. Flew is in because it involves a number of things which he must know before he can know that God exists. Now, in my experience with men who, however honestly they may do so, allege the atheistic position, you will find them not wishing to talk about these matters as if they had absolutely no responsibility whatever. But he cannot prove that God does not exist unless he can first prove that matter really does exist non-contingently. That is, that it is eternal, that it did not have a beginning. He must prove, secondly, that matter is all that exists. Note in the chart, however, Dr. Flew on the left side of the chart, and these matters constitute a barrier between his going from that side to the other side, where he can say, I know that God does not exist, so that he has established atheism. 
In the third place, a great barrier to his doing so is the, the obligation of proving that matter has always existed. Fourth, that no one piece of matter is worth any more than any other piece of matter. Now, if all, everything that exists is matter, simply molecules in motion, there really can be no ultimate or significant difference in any piece of matter. There can only be different arrangements of matter. That by sheer chance, he must prove that by sheer chance, rocks and dirt, that is, dear matter, dead matter, possibly including gases and water, became living matter. He has never seen this occur. He has absolutely no proof for it, and yet his whole case depends upon it. Six, that by sheer chance, rocks and dirt, ultimately, by various changes which he alleges, became, became conscious matter. Seventh, that by sheer chance, rocks and dirt, by a series of changes, became human matter, became human beings. On the next chart, the very next chart, uh, 9A1, no, 9A2. Number eight, that by sheer chance, rocks and dirt develop in such a way that a woman was, was first on earth before any human baby. Or that by sheer chance, rocks and dirt developed in such a way that a baby was first on earth before any woman. I want to reiterate in your hearing, he has not dealt with this matter at all. He cannot do so. He cannot tell you which was first, a woman or a baby. His reference to that of human or things that were neither human nor human cannot deal with this matter. Number 10, he must know that by sheer chance, rocks and dirt developed the human female breast so they could change blood into milk. That there is no law higher than the civil and or criminal law of a society or nation. Twelfth, that when a human being dies, his or her death is the absolute end of him or her. The totality of his or her being goes to dust. He has no way of knowing that. If it isn't the case, then atheism isn't true. That by sheer chance, rocks and dirt develop conscience. That by sheer chance, rocks and dirt develop spiritual capacity, the need for salvation from sin, right relationship with God, the hope of eternal life. That is the recognition of it in human hearts and human breasts. That by sheer chance, rocks and dirt developed intelligence. That by sheer chance, rocks and dirt developed a respiratory system in human beings. Now, friend, none of us can live more than five minutes without air, without oxygen. There must occur in the human lungs, in the alveoli, the air passage and the blood passage, a osmosis of oxygen into the blood from the air and carbon dioxide from the blood into the air. This occurs because of a difference of pressure tension in the air passage of the oxygen particles as over against what is in the oxygen of the blood. So the oxygen in the air passes through the capillary wall into the blood, but the carbon dioxide, because of a difference of pressure in the carbon dioxide in the blood and in the air, passes through the capillary wall into the air. And therefore, it could not have evolved since all atheists recognize that it demands millions of years for such changes to involve such complexity. Dr. Warren and I are, I think, coming closer together about the law of the excluded middle. Um, he was putting the point in which is exactly what I'd want to emphasize, that every precisely stated proposition is either true or false. Um, uh, yes, indeed. Um, if we, um, instead of using the word bold in the everyday meaning of the word, if we um, uh, define it in terms of either total number of hairs or uh, you know, populousness per square inch, then indeed it'll be a straight uh, matter. Either there are 99 per square inch or there are not. Um, so, uh, we're obviously moving together on that. About um, whether I've met anyone um, who was uh, not unequivocally either human or non-human, yes, I'm afraid I have. I've met people who were um, uh, very senile. I've also met people who were mad. And it did seem to me that it raised a very serious and bitter problem whether you could say that these people were any longer people. Um, uh, second thing, um, about 
the things that I'm supposed to show that matter must exist non-contingently, that's to say be eternal, that matter must be all, that matter must never have begun. I don't see why that's necessary at all. It seems to me that someone could um, uh, uh, perfectly consistently be an atheist and believe that the universe was going as a matter of fact to have an end or believe that it had had a beginning um, uh, and wasn't going to have an end. You know, I do as a matter of, I am as a matter of fact inclined to believe that matter is without end and without beginning, but I don't see why I've got to. This concludes part one of the four-night debate, Does God Exist?, held at the North Texas State University Coliseum. Today, Dr. A.G.N. Flew has held to the atheistic position in his affirmation, I know that God does not exist. Dr. Thomas B. Warren has defended God's existence as the negative disputant. The churches of Christ are not only committed to the existence of God, but are also committed to the restoration of New Testament Christianity. We invite you to visit our services. Any questions or comments concerning this debate are welcome.